Computers keep changing the world, but their power and safety is limited by their rigid design. The T2 Tile project works for bigger and safer computing using Living Systems principles. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. This is the 25th T Tuesday update. Let's get into it. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, so this one may go a little long. I'm going to let it go a little bit long, like maybe 25 minutes. We'll see. Uh, so last week we've got updates uh, from on the 3D printer, on the bill of materials, and on the PCB assembling. Uh, 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 coming up, I want to deal with something, well, I'll explain it when I get to it, and also I did a bunch of stuff with new software for the uh, movable feast machine for the T2 tile that I want to show you some a little bit of it as well, and that's why it'll take a little extra time. So let's go. Uh, um, ROHS stands for Reduction of Hazardous Substances. It's pronounced ROHAS, as far as I can tell. It's a, a directive that comes out of the EU that says basically when we're building products, especially tech products, maybe stuff in general, I'm not sure, it would be better if we didn't have a lot of poison in them because we have to live with them and then put them in landfills or put them in rivers or wherever they end up. So it's a good thing. Um, Rojas is. And uh, one of the big problems with Rojas is lead in solder. Uh, uh, and we talked about this earlier that, um, you know, what all of the prototypes that I've been hand soldering myself, these guys that we've been looking at, so forth, these are all using leaded solder because leaded solder is easy to handle. Uh, um, but that's why we go to the pros to get lead free. To, uh, and I had had some discussions back and forth with ETS uh, that I guess led to a misunderstanding or I misremembered or something. Uh, there was a little bit of difficulty because I was always kind of trying to get to an actual like contract with language and ETS really didn't seem to want that. So they don't, they don't work with the contracts, there's a handshake and so on. So I said, oh, well, okay, if that's the way it works. Uh, um, but now when I was actually getting serious about actually trying to get the... Uh, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> the stuff scheduled because the bill of materials is going to be there. Uh, um, and I was getting in touch with ETS and saying, you know, when can we schedule to do this? We're looking for 150 to 200 tiles with Rojas processing and a part supplied, board supplied by me, and so forth. Uh, um, but the response was, you know, do the assemblies have to be lead free? They'd like to web wave solder those. And there's, there was a typo saying the wave is lead free. They meant the wave is leaded or lead tin. Uh, uh, and that they quoted based on assuming they could put lead, they could be using lead based solder. And so the implication is it will take longer and the price will go up yet again. And, you know, this is exactly what I was sort of worried about when I was trying in my nerd way to get everybody to agree on what the language was going to be and get it written writing and so forth. And now at the last minute, this is coming up. So I didn't really feel like good about that. But really, the problem, the fault, you know, to the degree that there's any fault, it's mine for uh, not either pushing the issue or at least getting some comparative quotes other than just the online guys that were so ridiculously expensive. Uh, uh, let's try to find some kind of apples to apples uh, comparison to see whether you know this is reasonable or whether the price should go up or not. So in fact, this past week I did reach out to other PC board assemblers. There's more than one in Albuquerque, Albuquerque's big city, by Albuquerque standards. And now I am talking uh, with other folks about getting uh, a quote uh, uh, and, you know, be very explicit, Rojas, rah, 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 right from the get-go. And and we'll see what they say. I mean, if their quote is wildly higher, um, if it's in line with the revised quote that we would get from ETS, well, then, you know, so be it. Uh, um, but I just sort of feel like I need to do due diligence before just saying, uh, okay. So that was a little bit of a bummer, but it make it uh, hopefully it'll come out fine. However, it comes out, and we'll find out more information uh, in the next week. So that's the scheduling issue. Uh, are we going to have the boards being manufactured in process before the twenty sixth, before the mid season, half a year, according to a real season? Uh, um, Probably not, uh, but we're making serious blows down in the last uh, thing uh, steps of the thing. So that's the manufacturing story. Uh, um, 
on the 3D printing story. Last week, if you recall, I had uh, been ha having a chat with the, the uh, Prusa uh, ser uh, service people, well, just the Prusa customer support people, and they couldn't tell me how to do warranties, get a warranty service, or how much it would cost, or how to get an RMA. And uh, where we ended up was the c customer service person had said, I left a message for the, uh, the whoever it is uh, when they come in in the morning. And in fact, uh, that um, did arrive. Um, so, uh, a, uh, the, the guys at the department forwarded this to me when it came in the next day, uh, uh, and without going through it all too much, uh, basically it's a quote for an hour of work for 34 bucks, which seems like a pretty good price for an hour of work based on the United States standards, but also two uh, one-way DHL shipments, $110 each, uh, and $100 was what it cost to get the thing sent to me to begin with. But here there's absolutely no implication that if it is a warranty claim that Prusa would pay at least one direction of shipping, nothing like that. I can pay a round-trip shipping and I can pay an hour on top of it. And so that's 254 bucks. Uh, for them to take a look at it, see if it's a warranty claim, and, and maybe fix it. Uh, there was an email that went with it that said it's not. It's just uh, don't know how many hours it would really take, so just the price of one. So 254 bucks. That's an absolute minimum. <sighs> don't feel great about that. Uh, uh, got back with the folks in the chat room. Uh, uh, Andrew Walpole was saying, you know, well, maybe in fact, what you need to try and do is find somebody local in Albuquerque that could repair these things or understand it and so forth. Uh, these three proven systems things, uh, uh, guys that do 3d stuff. In fact, I reached out to 3d proven systems using their web-based, uh, contact thing. You know, my name is Dave Ackley. I'd like to introduce you. Uh, now they had a list of manufacturers and Prusa was not on their list of manufacturers. So that didn't seem like it was too encouraging. And in fact, uh, I got mail back from Lance Detmers, a very nice guy, uh, some technical part of the company. And we had a little uh, chat uh, in email over last week uh, uh, that sort of boiled down to, yeah, they don't really do Prusa stuff. They could probably look at it because printers are all fairly similar, but then they're $125 an hour for repairs uh, in the U.S. So that didn't seem like something I wanted to pursue immediately, although I really felt good about uh, Lance Atmer and 3D Proven Systems, and he's uh, spinning off a Route 9 company that's actually going to be focusing on three contract pre 3D printing, which in fact could use at some point. So that was not a solution, although it ended up feeling good. So the solution, huh, the next step was, well, let's just drag the printer in, to, uh, put it on the bench and see what we can see about it. This is what it looks like when you take the, the steel, uh, spring steel bed off it that's held down by magnets. I was really suspecting this uh, uh, area in the back where the, the cable uh, connects to the print bed. I mean, this, this print bed slides back and forth to change the Z component of where it's printing. And so this, the, this, this cable, which is wrapped in, in, in textile is is flexing all the time and so all right uh so I, I took a look at it i also was flipping it over and taking a look up underneath at the bottom so this is looking up at the build plate from the bottom this is the same old capped on tape that we saw when i was doing the reflow soldering myself so this in fact right up underneath here is the the thermistor the heat sensor connected to a cable that's going out through that cable in the back that we're getting er min temp bed about that for some reason either this thing isn't signaling or the guy at the other end isn't hearing the signal this looked fine to me and it's not like i was using any kind of weird plastic that's extremely high temperature that might be degrading the adhesive on the kapton tape pla not that hot so this really looked all not terrible, which once again reinforced my notion that it was probably something to do with that cable connection. Uh, uh, I looked at it, I found the screw holes at it, I went and I got my socket wrench and I unscrewed it. I took the bottom uh, thing off and just took a look at it. So what you end up 
seeing. Uh, you see these two lugs. Those are connecting the actual uh, power lines that are going to the heat heater that takes a lot of current to just heat up the bed. And then th this thing that looks like basically a regular, uh, you know, zip cord uh, is presumably the two wires for the temperature sensor because it's the only other two other wires that are there. Now, when I opened this up, it did seem to me like the uh, cable was kind of tight and I couldn't really find out what was going on up this uh, cable uh, up the textile thing because it was held down or hot glued or something I wasn't entirely sure but when I decided to just close this thing back up I tried to ease the cable a little bit you know cram a little bit more of the textile end underneath the 3d printed clamps that I was screwing up so that maybe it wasn't pulling so much on the thing uh, um, and I screwed it back in with my socket wrench um, and uh, set it back up. Uh, so now this was a reel uh, of the prusament that was almost out uh, anyway. So I thought, well, what the heck, let's just give it a try, see what happens. Um, and in fact, it started out printing fine, which proves nothing. Uh, when this thing gets ermin temp bed, it could be two hours into the print. It could be six hours into the print. So the fact that it got through the first 10 minutes was nice, but it didn't prove anything. Uh, uh, but we were running out of the filament, so I was going to have to change it. So I, I got this roll of silver, old silver that I had lying around from before, because I really didn't want to blow more of the stuff that was matched to what was going to be in the cases if I didn't believe this was actually really going to work. So I paused the printer uh, when it would get to the end because once again I still wasn't going to trust the automatic film changing system. Uh, I put in the new stuff. I did the load filament thing. I got it pouring out half, you know, uh, Mr. Twizzle uh, bicolor ice cream, half black, half silver. And I thought everything was fine. I thought I was going to now be able to go back and continue with these guys that now had a front black plate and would have gray behind it. It would be cool. No. For some reason, uh, it decided, even though we had already loaded the filament and said it was fine, it decided to poop a bunch more uh, silver on top of the thing when it went back to fix it. I, I tried to pull that stuff off to see if I could uh, keep going, but no way. And in fact, I had already knocked one of Pinocchio's shoes out of position anyway. So this print was ruined but not because of min temp error so i said well screw it let's just get the real stuff and, and put it in and see what happens it's only money if i have to go buy more of this stuff and i started up a regular print and lo and behold eight hours later we had three more cases uh, um so that was good. I did a few more goes. I got another few more sets of three cases. I felt like, you know, hey, I have the healing hands. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, put it on the thing, it's fixed. Yeah, no. After a while, though, uh, it it started to die, and this one died early. The one that broke my heart was this one, which was, you know, easily uh, six or six hours into the print over halfway, certainly. Uh, through the thing before it died and so forth. But nonetheless, in this whole process, because I didn't really have anything else to do, uh, I sort of have developed this whole superstitious procedure that I do every time I'm about to start a print. I lift up the base, I push on where the, the capped on tape, where the thermistor is, in case it could have gotten early, I'd set it back down. I untrap the textile cable from the heat bed, which gets caught but between that uh, the control unit on the side there and the extruder. I loosen that up and I, I spread it out so it's more evenly back instead of being up uh, bent so vertically at the joint and in fact that in that process I've learned to that you know a couple of times when I did that I created an er min temp bed which just served to convince me that yes that's where the problem is it's in the cable uh, connection to the bed but since I developed this superstitious process, eventually I got rid of lifting up the thing and touching the thermistor because it doesn't seem to matter. But easing the cable at the beginning of each thing, I have not had a failure again, an ermin temp bed failure since then. And in fact, uh, we are now getting to the bottom of that reel that I started in. This was a picture just from an hour or so. You might occasionally hear the printer going in the background. It's finishing off that roll as we speak. 
the net result is we got a whole nother box of cases out of this. So now we have three complete cases. That's 36 in a box. That's 108 cases. We have another 24 of the older style that takes the socket cap countersink. Uh, uh, that puts us up at 108, 128, 130-something. Uh, if we can get another box through, or, or even better, two boxes out of this thing, we will have enough cases almost surely. So that's the 3D printing story. <laughs> uh, I hate not having a proper diagnosis for these things, but there it is. Moving on. Um, uh, the bill of materials, yes. Uh, so where we left off there was we had uh, gone through this whole thing to get the P8 and P9 headers that the Beagle Bone Green will connect to the circuit board with. Had decided to go to AliExpress, the $43 for 200 with free shipping, which I hate because it's not guaranteed any kind of fast. Could have been 23 days. But in fact, last week, uh, uh, we had just when our, it arrived in L.A. and was expected to be delivered this past Thursday, uh, uh, it arrived in Albuquerque. Uh, it was not <laughs> on Thursday, uh, uh, but uh, it, you know, magically got rescheduled for Friday, and it showed up Friday. Here it was. Uh, uh, you know, once again, eighty-five bucks to me. But if you look on the cover, what this says is five bucks value. I hate this stuff. Uh, and there it is. There was not a lot of packing in along with the bags of connectors. Two bags of 200 connectors and then box. And I, th I think some of the pins actually that were sort of just kind of crammed a little bit in the edge got a little bit bent. So I'm not super happy about that. But I think they're all usable. So we'll see. And there they are. And again, 200 pieces, 200 pieces, 400 total takes two per tile. That means we have capabilities for 200 tiles right there. And with that, the bill of materials for what needs to be soldered onto the board is complete. We can go whenever we get an assembler that will work with us. Uh, uh, so that's quite... Uh, milestone even though there's really nothing to show for it as far as what works soon i hope uh, uh, in addition, uh, in addition to the tiles, we also need the inner tile connectors. We need a whole lot of them. Now, previously, I had modified it to put a little the series resistors in the middle when we thought we had all these problems with uh, oscilloscope noise and analog noise and stuff that turned out to be mostly just my brain damage. Uh, I went back and I cleaned up the design of the inner tile connector. This is the 3D rendering of it. This is the uh, circuit board layout circuit of it. Uh, uh, I like this layout much better. I, I cleaned it up in several ways. I really am getting a little bit more confidence in this now that it's almost uh, the end of the road for needing it, at least in the T2. Uh, uh, and I ordered uh, nine of them from Osh Park. The idea is we'll get these quickly, we'll check and make sure they're okay, and then we're going to try to do an order for hundreds of these things from somebody, probably in China, uh, we shall see, to simultaneously make the circuit boards, acquire the parts that go on it, which is just two female connectors, uh, solder them all up and send it back to us, boom, in one go. We'll see how that goes. Uh, uh, and the boards, in fact, have been sent off to the fab, and we'll see them probably before I talk to you again. That's the logistics division. There's yet more. <sighs> May 9th and 10th, I'm going to be in Vienna uh, giving this invited talk at this thing called the uh, the Pioneer... Pioneers 2019, the Pioneers Festival, something like that. It's mostly about uh, startups, European-based startups and entrepreneurs and so forth. There's lots of speakers, uh, of which I am now one of them. That I was invited, and, you know, I'm hoping that there'll be a good, excited crowd and we can spread the word about computation 2.0 about living computation about there is another way coming down the road it's a little early for most startups but hopefully they'll be excited to hear about it uh I, a friend uh connected me with these guys and he's going to be there as well and he he's been there previously and says you know they're they're good crowds they're excited they're big uh, crowds and so forth so we shall see vienna may 9th and 10th 
uh, uh, all right. Uh, um, but there's also new software engineering to talk about. And uh, I'm calling them data worms. You'll see why in a minute. I don't really, not totally thrilled with the name. I would uh, turn to uh, uh, our community out here for suggestions on names. I mean, worms isn't terrible, but, well, you'll see. Yeah, uh, all right, so to introduce this story, uh, um, <clears throat> there is a video uh, on my uh, original channel, on the Dave Ackley YouTube channel, that's now going to be nine years old, I'm sorry, eight years old, going to be eight years old uh, this year from 2011, <clears throat> Asymmetric Diffusion of Bonded Structures in the Moodle Feast Machine. What the heck is that? Well, so you, you watch it, and what it is is these bunch of atoms that are connected by little lines uh, uh, and they they wiggle and they move and they go around and when they get over here to the yellow thing the yellow thing tells them to go down and the white thing tells them to go west and the green thing tells them to go north and in general it's kind of like a worm uh, that that wiggles around and can be directed uh, to do things now one of the things that comes up this is a, a action shot from the middle of that video where so you can see these these the balls are these atoms the lines are these bonds between the atoms uh, um and the this particular uh, molecule has now gotten stuck it's gotten hooked on to the edge of a pointy little bit of wall or something like that uh now eventually this thing popped free and it kept on going so it was all right but this is one of the fundamental problems of the whole idea of bonds. And the early versions of the movable feast machine had this idea of bonds that you could have atoms that were aware of each other and wouldn't get too far away uh, built into the low level engine. But when we went to more recent versions of the movable feast machine, although more recent is like five years ago now, uh, we ditched the idea of bonds because it seemed they were too specific and we didn't really know what we wanted out of them. So you don't see any of these lines in the Moodle Feast machine simulator today, and that's because bonds are not built into the underlying architecture. You know, you could, the bonds are implemented with software. They're basically a doubly linked list. Each atom in here remembers the site where it saw the guy who's downstream of it and, and the, the site where he saw the upstream of it. And everybody agrees that when anybody moves, you update the site numbers of the guys that are pointing at you and the guys that you're pointing at to keep the consistency of the list going. And that's how bonds work. In this past week, uh, well, actually, it goes back a couple of weeks into the wall of science period. One of the things that I was working on was, you know, so how can we get big things to move? Asymmetric diffusion of bonded structures has been a concern for the movable feast for years. And one of the, and so we had these the big cell membranes that they kind of moved and so forth, and we, that we had uh, the the two D printer that had lines moving through it, swap lines that would move through it that would kind of move a whole big two D structure uh, step by step. One of the things I realized in the last week or two was that if you took the idea of a swap line where you waited until everybody caught up with you and then you moved one step, and you boiled that down to a single dimension swap line. So now it's just one atom swapping along a line. It becomes very simple. And so let's look at it. Uh, hello? All right, here we are. So now, here, let me get a... Uh, we'll take a look at this guy. All right. Well, what happened here? So this thing is an... An S worm, uh, he's got a bunch of types. Green means he's the head, red means he's the tail, this light green means he's the body, and these blue things means that these are temporary structures that are being passed through from head to tail. So if we do an individual event here, like this guy, uh, can I do him? Uh, uh, I, oh, I guess we're too close to the edge. We'll just let it go automatic. It'll be quick, but you'll get the idea. Um, there. So you see what happens? The a blue, the head, every so often the head moves to a new site, leaves a blue uh, behind it, and the blue gets swapped all the way down from the top to the bottom. And when the blue swaps with the tail, with the red guy, it just gets consumed and disappears. So the net effect is, is that we get these little worms uh, uh, that are moving around. At this point, it's just moving randomly. I mean, did, did, 
did did everybody still have that snake game or was that just from computers when i was a kid where you drive this worm around and you'd eat the little stars and every time he ate a star so you know this guy wound himself into a circle and the old game of snake right that means you lost that guy and that's what happens here and that's just inevitable in the sense that you're, the whole idea of this thing is rather than using a bond that fills empty space, you use these temp atoms that keep track of where the guy is by keeping track of where he had been. And so we, if we have a bunch of these guys, they will all go running around. And the S worms, they kind of stand for simple worms or stupid worms or something like that. Uh, um, when, since, given that they're just wandering around randomly, they, they wrap themselves in a knot where they can't get out uh, rather quickly. But we also have the bee worm. Uh, um, and all right, uh, uh, let's, let's just take this guy specifically. We're going over our 25 minutes, but I'm almost done. I'll show you what I wanted to show you. Uh, oh, that's a simple worm. Uh, so well, so all right, so he's not going to go anywhere. Let's get a bee worm. All right, there's a bee worm. All right, now if we put a wall around that guy all right now there's no place for the head to go because he only looks north south east west the simple worm just looks you see he doesn't even look diagonally because his structure is not uh, smart enough to do that because his next and previous pointers as a doubly linked list are two bits long it's just one two three or four which adjacent guy is upstream of you and which is downstream of you that's it but look what happens to the bee worm now that when the head figures out it's trapped. He builds a bridge. Uh, uh, yellow is the downstream edge of the bridge, the, the heading toward the tail. The dark blue or black is the upstream abutment of the bridge, heading from the tail towards the head. And he escapes. And so now he can get on out and go about his business and so on. And, you know, the bridging worms, the bee worms, they can get trapped too, but they can only get trapped in a smaller number of circumstances. If they're completely surrounded, they can only bridge a single site. Now, with, with more programming, they might actually be able to bridge two sites, but it's a lot, uh, a lot more code. And the code here is not quite as simple as I would like it to be, but it's pretty simple. And think about this. Once you, ha you know, each of these things has seven bytes available. One of these worms has a hundred. 112 bytes of unused space that they could be carrying a hello world, a string, a number. These things could meet up with each other and do arithmetic as they pass along each other. You could compute with the data worms. Uh, um, and once you have the bridging worms, you can do things like, these don't have to be 16 segments long. This is just the particular uh, demo that I uh, organized. You could make circuits. You could have that circle, circuit lines that hop over each other and go on about their business. You could use this as a basis for much more understandable, evident computation going on, intracellular, intracellular, sending queries out, and so on. I had previously had a routing demo where we just sent around single atoms. Well, what good is that? We could redo that routing demo. I would like to. I haven't got the time that you would use data worms as passing through there. So again, we could be, tra we could be transmitting non-trivial payloads. All right. So this I'm very excited about. It's, you know, really incredibly simple, and that's kind of the point. It's meant to be a basis, and it's really a spatial, doubly linked list. And that's it. Simple. I mean, if you, you blow a hole in the middle of one of these guys, you know, they're not designed to be uh, amazingly uh, uh, robust. Uh, uh, they know more or less how to clean themselves up, although it can take a while. Uh, uh, oh, that guy's still been rolling around out there, uh, and, and so on. <laughs> and uh, so I built a little track for these guys to run on, uh, uh, imitating the 2011 video where, you know, green means go north and yellow means go south and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it takes a while to go, but I have, I have made a, a, a time travel video that shows it happening much quicker. Uh, um, uh, where is it? Uh, here it is. Uh, uh, like that. This is going to start going faster and faster and faster. Uh, um, I don't know if we can hear anything on the sound, 
but the sound is at the pitch of the sound is reflecting the uh, air, the, the number of events per second, which is kind of a reasonable thing to do. Okay, at a time. Lots of developments happening, hardware, software, all of this stuff. The next update will be out in a week. That will be the 26th T Tuesday update. Sorry this went long. Was it too long? I think it was had some good stuff in it. I'm kind of getting excited about the whole thing coming together a little bit more. I hope to see you next week.